H. It's a pleasure to be with you, and I know uh, there's a lot of interest in this topic, so um, we're really excited to hear what you think about this toolkit and what, how it might be useful to you and what questions we can answer as it's launched and you start using it with the agencies that you're working with. Let's go to the first slide, please. So I want to start with just talking about the purpose of this toolkit. Uh, we talked about the fact that this isn't a toolkit that helps you decide whether or not to reallocate or convert resources. It's also not about project resources that fund the program itself. It's very specific to transitional housing buildings. So this really gets to the core issues around building finance and owning and operating a building. So uh, it really provides guidance on converting resources that are related to building finance. Next slide. So I uh, want to tell you today that the kind of purpose of this webinar is to tell you all about what's in the toolkit, get you familiar with it. I think as you read through it, these slides will be very relevant. They kind of give you the highlights of what you'll find in there. And there's three main sections in the toolkit itself. The first is around the six steps to approaching project funders, because to unwind the resources in a transitional housing building, you're going to have to talk to a lot of project funders. So we talk about how to get ready for those conversations, understanding your audience, and what you need to do to make sure that your project funders are on board with this kind of a change. Then we get into a little bit about understanding building resources. I don't think it's critical for everyone who wants to undertake this kind of work to know everything about housing finance, but this will give folks that are doing this work in the field a little bit of confidence about those resources and how they work and help prepare them for those conversations with funders. And then we get specifically into four common fund sources that we find in buildings that operate transitional housing, and that's essentially a resource and reference guide to understand some of the core aspects of the written agreements for those four fund sources. Next slide. So as we developed this, something that became really clear is that when we're talking about converting buildings that operate transitional housing, we're really talking about converting resources. So we refer in the toolkit to these resources as building resources. And these are the financing sources, the resources, the money that are tied directly to the financing of a building itself. And that's a really important distinction here, is that this toolkit is all about those resources that are related to the capital underwriting, the acquisition, construction, and rehabilitation of a building. Those are, on the capital side, the most common types of fund sources you'll see. As well, on the operating side, there are ongoing operating sources and or project-based rental assistance that are directly tied to the building itself. So it's not just a subsidy that is held by a tenant, but it's in fact integrated into the underwriting of the capital construction or rehabilitation of the project. So it was intrinsically financed as part of that original underwriting or rehabilitation underwriting. Next slide. So I'll just pause here, um, and uh, maybe if uh, someone from the Alliance wants to speak to this, I think we probably want to collect questions as we go along. I know all the participants are muted right now, but you could type your questions into the chat box, and then when we get to the Q&A, we'll have a, a queue of them. Anyone want to add anything about how to manage questions? Um. Right now, it doesn't look like any questions have come in, but yeah, that's a great way. If anyone has questions, please send them, and we'll be collecting them for the end. That's OK, Debbie. Perfect, thanks. So uh, getting into this first section, I'm going to give you a little overview of the six steps to approaching your project funders. You can go to the next slide. The first one is to assemble your team. And you can go ahead and click through. I think each member of the team is on here separately. But certainly your executive director or your 
your agency that you're working with, their executive director is going to be critical to making sure this happens. And this is really at a point where the decision has already been made to do this, but now you have to go through the actual actions of conversion. So executive directors buy in, the program director, the person running the transitional housing program, of course. If there is a development director, that is a key person to have on board here, but it's not always the case. And in fact, in many cases where a nonprofit owns a transitional housing building, there's not a development director. They did this as a one-time event, and they might own one, maybe two buildings. So if there is a development director and it's a big agency, that's a critical person because they're going to understand the financing. Uh, certainly, the board of directors at some point will have to get involved in approving these changes. But if there's not a development director on board, it's not often the program director that's going to know a lot about building finances and, and even who the funders are in the project. I remember doing one transitional housing analysis, working with a program director and talking about the financing and understanding, you know, was, was this paid for with home? Are there tax credits in it? And they said, oh, I don't know anything about that. Uh, we, we don't. We don't have anything to do with that anymore. This building was built 10 years ago, and uh, that, that's all done. And I said, well, I'm sure there's somebody on your staff who's still paying attention to that original capital financing, because there's a lot of important ongoing covenants and agreements that you have to uphold. And they said, well, I, you know, I don't know who that would be. And I, I suggested that it might be someone in their finance department. And they said, oh, you mean Margaret? Yeah, she's always asking me about these buildings. You know, so it's, it's Margaret. It's that person in your finance or accounting team that is paying attention to those covenants that the program directors may not even know about. It's important to get to the table. Now, that said, that person might be tracking compliance and ongoing monitoring and accountability for funders, but may not have the full skill set to do and unwind and have those conversations with the funders directly. And in that case, if there's no development director on board, bringing in a development consultant could be really helpful. Or an attorney that has that kind of background and does these kind of financing deals. So it's important to have somebody who understands these resources really well and can help you speak the same and help your agency speak the same language as the funders. Next slide. So the written agreements. I think this is one of the most critical steps. The written agreements will answer very important questions for the provider about exactly what they committed to and for how long. And if applicable, they'll get their information there about any sale or transfer that might occur as a result of this conversion. And most importantly, they'll know what the penalty is for not fulfilling their commitments and for how long those conditions are in place, and that will give them a lot of information about when or how to convert and what's important to their project funders. So the written agreements are those documents that are probably in a file cabinet somewhere in the back office in the accounting department, and not ones that people look at very often. So it's going to be really important to get clear about which fund sources have written agreements, where they are, and to really dig them out and read them. Uh, I've given some highlights later on about which sections to read, so you don't necessarily have to read through all the legalese, and you can kind of hone in on what's going to be most important to the funders. Next slide. So this, this step, I think, could to some degree go without saying, but it really is important to keep in mind that as a provider who owns transitional housing, who's got to this point of having a conversation with their project building funders, they've gone through a lot of analysis, a lot of thinking, a lot of hard decision making to get to that point. But this is going to be brand new to some of their funders. This whole concept of undoing something that was supposed to be in place for 20, 30, 40, 75 years is, is really a new idea to a lot of folks in the funding world. You know, they're used to putting a deal together, a couple years of development, it gets up and running, check the box, these are the units that we have online. And there's often not anyone 
especially in the capital funding side, whose job it is to unwind commitments. And in fact, it's usually frowned upon to even propose such an idea. So I'm, I'm talking mostly about folks in city and county departments administering homes, CDBG, local and state capital resources. This is going to be a really new concept to them. So it's going to be very important to be clear about why this is important to your agency and to your whole COC. So demonstrating support from others is really important. If the agency you're working with has support from the COC lead, that could be very useful. Having those documents ready would be a great way to get the conversation going more quickly. And because the first thing the funders are going to think is, well, what did we say? What did you agree to? And being ready and having some of those documents ready and highlighted could make the conversation move along. Being prepared to protect and support tenants will also be very important to funders. They want to know what's going to happen to the people who are currently living in that building. Next slide. So along with knowing that this is going to be a new concept, to the project funders of that building, it's good to know what is important to those folks, to the people you're actually going to be sitting down with. And I say you, assuming you may be doing the TA to sit down with your provider and help them have some of these conversations. Uh, there's a, several priorities in the minds of people who do this kind of affordable, transitional, and um, affordable and transitional housing finance, essentially. The first is to serve people with low incomes. And, and this is often a priority of the fund that actually comes from the origination of the uh, either council approval or Congress approval of those funds, that these funds are dedicated to serving people with low income. So it's often a priority, and it's often very clearly stated. Another priority is to serve people who are homeless. And I would say this is sometimes prioritized, but in building finance, you might be using a source that's not specifically dedicated to people who are homeless. So while this is often stated in the original RFP or NOFA for the allocation of funds, it's not often stated in the actual written agreement. So that's just good to know, because there's often a lot of assumptions providers make about what's in their written agreements that they had to serve a certain population or they had to do it in a certain way. And when it comes down to building finance and legal covenants, you're not always going to see that level of detail. Probably even less common in terms of written agreements is seeing that there's a requirement to use time-limited transitional housing as the approach to serving people. So it's less often prioritized in these building resources and not often stated. Now, there are clear exceptions around this, especially in terms of HUD funding specifically for the purpose of ending homelessness and creating transitional housing. But essentially, if you get into other resources, tax credits, home and CDBG, you're not often going to see any requirements around time limits. Next slide, please. So learning the basics about your buildings fund resources will be really important for the agencies that you're working with. Uh, as we say in the toolkit, you don't have to be an expert on this, but I think folks do feel sometimes a little bit intimidated if this isn't their main field and want to be able to have a conversation around those building resources. So just doing a little homework up front could be really helpful. And I'm hoping some of the resources in this guide will be helpful to you all as well as TA providers to have some background on what some of the common restrictions are of these fund sources. We'll get into this in a little bit more detail in one of the other sections of the toolkit. Let's go to the sixth one. So a funding gap can occur between the end of the current funding period and the beginning of the new one. And this happens really in any reallocation uh, or conversion of resources. It doesn't always happen, but it does fairly often. So it's important to mind that gap and, and be clear about how you're going to address it financially in the interim. So when you're talking about a building, there's a, another layer in addition to just how you're going to pay for staff and the services that you're providing, but also the housing operations in this case. So 
if there's a temporary pause in the rental subsidy or operating subsidy in a project, that can have a big impact on the overall financial well-being of that building. So if a rehabilitation is planned, that could be even longer. So it's really important up front to do some strategizing and potentially even some fundraising for how to cover that gap. Next slide. OK, and you can go to the next one. So really looking in detail then at the uh, written agreements, you're going to get to know a little bit about the resources that are in those buildings and where some of the requirements and restrictions are. There's three key elements to stand for when someone wants to convert one of their buildings. Use restrictions, which tell you how the building can be used. Sale and transfer provisions, if applicable. And then that penalty section that says what happens if those things aren't followed. Next slide. In terms of use restrictions, this gets back a little bit to what you'll find in terms of the priorities of the people administering the funding. But in the written agreements themselves, I think you're most likely to see affordability as your number one priority of your funders. Almost, well, really all of the resources you're going to have in a transitional housing building that was construct constructed or rehabilitated with capital operating and project-based rental assistance is going to have some kind of covenants or written agreements around affordability. You might also see something around population served. You might, as I said, but in a more limited fashion, see something around time limits. And you will very likely see some language around use as housing. This is an important piece in terms of use restrictions because in some cases, the financing that went into that building was very specifically around affordable housing and has to always be preserved as some type of housing. Now, in the case of multifamily housing, you're not likely going to encounter providers who even want to convert to some other use. The, the building itself is, is likely to stay as housing. But where we do see some interest in changing the use as housing is where you have a congregate facility of some kind or a single family home. And in particular, with transitional housing, there's a fair number of single family homes that are used in this model. So it may be that uh, the provider doesn't want to own and operate one single family home as permanent housing, and they want to convert it to some other use. So it's going to be important to see what the written agreements say about the use of housing, and if there's a change to it, what that change might look like. Next slide. So sale or transfer is a, another layer of potential conversion. And Katie will talk a little bit about this as well in the Memphis example. But essentially, this whole toolkit applies to anyone who is looking to sell or transfer the ownership of their building. It would apply to that new owner. And some provisions will apply to the transaction itself. So the idea here in those written agreements and covenants is that the person or the entity that built this building originally for the purpose of providing affordable housing in their community cannot profit off of the sale of that building itself. So those covenants that are in place on that building are kept in place when the building is sold or transferred to any new owner. And generally speaking, I'll just say transfers are a little more straightforward because there's no money exchange. So you don't have to get into the whole analysis of uh, public benefiting from public investments. Next slide. So penalties. Uh, this is this is where you're going to find out what exactly the penalty is for changing these written agreements. They exist for that purpose to make sure that people uphold those very long-term agreements, and they're the financial lever leverage that funders use to ensure that their investments are going to serve people with low incomes, and there's no profit on the development of affordable housing with public resources. So they often require repayment of funds that were originally awarded to the building. You'll see that in a lot of penalty language. So if, if there's going to be a sale, 
then were a change of use, then you're going to have to pay back. Some require payment for a portion or all of the proceeds. Most penalties decline over time. So if you have a building that requires you to serve people with low incomes for, uh, say, 50 years, it will have a steeper penalty in the early years for making a change to that covenant and a lesser penalty over time as you get closer to that 50 years. So it's important to take a look at what that language is and see exactly where the owner is and their ownership. They may be very close to the end of their covenant term, in which case it may be simpler to wait till the end of it. Depends on what fund sources are in there. From what I understand, HUD is pretty willing to have this conversation at any stage of the game as long as there's a clear and approved public use in the change of the building. But other funders might not be as willing to do that, so it's important to get a sense of how close you are. In a lot of cases, we're finding buildings are actually fairly far along within their covenants and may be able to just wait it out a year or so before making a change, or the penalties are small enough that it's worth making the change. Next slide. Okay, so this last section of the toolkit gets into four common building sources that the providers you're working with probably likely have in their buildings. We wanted to just get into a little bit of detail here to give folks some comfort about knowing what some of those provisions are within each of these fund sources. The toolkit itself gets into quite a bit more detail than we will here in the webinar. But the four fund sources that we highlighted are low-income housing tax credits, HUD COC funds, home, and project-based vouchers. These are the most common that I have seen. There, there are others, certainly. But I think it's useful for you and your providers to really take a look at each of those. Because what I often find is providers will say, oh, we can't do this. We're, we're not allowed to make these changes because of our HUD COC funds. And then you dig into it a little bit and say, wow, there's actually an opportunity to make some changes here. Let's take a look at that. We can't do that because of tax credits. Well, what is it about the tax credits that says you can't do it? Tax credits don't let you make changes. You know, there's just these kind of blanket ideas about what fund sources can and can't do. So digging into the written agreements will help dispel some of those myths. But we're also hoping that the toolkit can lay out some of the details for folks up front to give them some comfort for what may be possible and what the real provisions are from these fund sources. Next slide. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Katie, who is going to talk with you about how this has actually happened on the ground in Memphis. Thanks, Debbie, and thanks, everyone. My name is Katie Kitchen. I'm with CSH, and I've been with CSH for almost a couple years now. And prior to that, I was the lead agency and tenure plan administrator for the city of Memphis and Shelby County. So the examples I'm bringing today are reflecting that experience in Memphis. If you could advance the slide. So there were, uh, there were a number of conversions, but there were four specifically that took place that involved buildings that were owned by the nonprofit. So four agencies went through these conversions, and they impacted um, uh, a total of six buildings that were owned. So the first one, I think the one that is most um, interesting to folks, is this was a building that was operated as a transitional housing program for families with children. And it was um, very, un very much underutilized for a long period of time. So it was in the performance improvement zone where the COC had, had identified it as a low performer and had been uh, attempting some efforts to improve performance over time. It reached to the point where it was clear when the other programs in the continuum were operating at 90, 92% uh, occupancy, and this program was typically at 60%, that this bro program no longer met um, the community's need. We, there was a heavy investment in rapid rehousing, and in short, families were opting for that intervention over this particular program. So the COC and the project owner and the building owner 
made an agreement to that they would voluntarily um, get out of the transitional housing business and um, and put their grant back to the continuum for reallocation. It did, however, of course, impact the fact that they owned the building and that there were some deed restrictions associated with both the um, long time long term investments over time and some renovations that had occurred more recently. So they looked at what repayment was going to be required um, and they went and worked with HUD to come to a mutually agreeable decision about what would happen when that building was sold and how much uh, repayment would be required. In this case, because the building no longer met a community need um, and the occupancy had been so low for such a long period of time, they did, they did not have to um, have to provide a repayment. They were able to, to sell that building. There was so little left as far as the amount that would be uh, required to be repaid um, that it, it, it worked out in their favor for that uh, program. Another example involved four different buildings. Um, they're each multifamily, so there were duplexes, there were um, regular multifamily apartment buildings, and these were being operated as transitional housing also for families with children. And after a very long process involving many board retreats and um, a lot of understanding about where the research was leading us as a community and the direction that the community was undertaking in our tenure plan to end homelessness, they made the decision that they did not feel that operating permanent supportive housing was something that their agency would be good at or if it or, and neither did it promote the mission that they uh, had, had envisioned for their organization. They, perfued, they viewed themselves more in a crisis response um, a, a space within the continuum of, of services. So they opted to transfer those buildings to another nonprofit that was more mission oriented to operate permanent supportive housing. So through a partnership with the city, with these nonprofits, with HUD, um, they were able to make that transfer. We um, had to identify that gap filling uh, funding. So the city was and some uh, private foundation actually stepped up to provide operating support uh, between the time period when the first the HUD grants were transferred and then the new operating grant that they were able to get through the COC to operate permanent supportive housing was in place. So that um, was how that situation worked out and um, has become a great asset for the community. And then finally, there was another building um, incidentally owned by the same nonprofit that um, sold that building that their, their grant was actually reallocated uh, based on performance. They had not identified as being ready to convert it so that they were sort of forced into this position because of the performance of the program, as I expect many communities are with the most recent um, funding round. And with that, they um, were able to, they, they viewed themselves as more of a treatment provider and they were able to work with the state to identify some treatment resources that covered a bulk of the building's operating costs. And then the other, they had uh, recently begun a rapid rehousing program and were able to house staff and some program activities in that building. So they were able to keep the building, repurpose it, and identify other funding sources to sustain the operating costs. Next slide. So in a two-year period, um, the community of Memphis went from having 625 um, funded transitional housing beds to less than half, 283. So it was a big change for the community and it was certainly one that caused a lot of angst. Um, and concerns, but I can say that the um, the sort of initial phase of thinking through what, what this would mean um, was far worse than what actually the experience was. Um, people didn't lose their jobs. There was not a, um, a wholesale sea of people living on the streets as a result of all these changes. In fact, if you can go to the next slide. What happened was these changes actually contributed to the continued declines in the rate of homelessness, both uh, overall and then within each of the populations. So it, it really, um, all the fears that many had when we were approaching this big conversion 
uh, were not founded. And in fact, uh, the community did quite well and was able to actually have a net increase in the total amount of resources available to end homelessness. So the, that one project that involved all the transitional housing for families, they were able to convert to rapid rehousing and serve more than twice the number of people that they had served before. Um, and as I said, it contributed to overall declines in homelessness across populations. That's it.